And good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ken Adji. I'm the Deputy Commandant of the United States Army War College. And the assignment before that, I was at U.S. Africa Command uh, with uh, Ambassador Carter and uh, General Rodriguez. And it's uh, you know, always great to see uh, some familiar faces in the crowd. Um, this is the last panel of the day, and uh, throughout the day we've heard some great discussions from many people. So I uh, wanted to say uh, a final thank you from the War College and Major General Kem to uh, the uh, Association of the United States Army for hosting this and for the Peacekeeping Institute uh, for putting on a great program. So thank you very much. Uh, the last panel, the title, or the focus is uh, U.S. interest in Africa the next 10 years. So for the last couple hours we, we've, we've heard uh, from the distinguished panel members you know, what we have done, how we got there, and now it's an opportunity just to kind of sit back and, and think a little bit about the future of uh, what the United States government and, uh, you know, options are and the environment that, that, that will be playing out on the African continent over the next decade plus. Um, there, there's been some talk of, you know, what are the U.S. vital interests in Africa, and there are those who say there are no vital interests, there are just interests, and uh, most of those play out in, you know, whether it's security interest, geopolitical interest, economic interest, or humanitarian interest. Um, other definitions align more functionally, and it could be, you know, the migrant issue facing our European partners uh, or China's growing influence on Africa. So those are the things as we look forward uh, will be, have to be considered by our leadership. The, uh, we're all pretty familiar with the size and scope of Africa, not just geographically, but some of the challenges those 54 countries face. Uh, the, fund for, the Fund for Peace Frag Fragile States Index has their top 25, 19 of the countries are made up of uh, countries from Africa, uh, which makes any kind of uh, uh, strategy, policy from the government strategy to be executed a challenge. Um, so I'd like to introduce the, uh, the panel members. First, we'll start with Ambassador Retired Phil Carter. He is the president of the Mead Hill Group and the executive vice president of the Washington, D.C.-based international advisory firm, Jefferson Waterman International. Ambassador Carter, former career diplomat, has served as the deputy to the commander for civil military engagement at U.S. Africa Command. Previous tours, Department of State in Washington include senior advisor, acting assistant secretary, principal deputy assistant secretary to the Africa Bureau, director for West Africa Affairs, and deputy director in the office for East Africa Affairs of the U.S. State Department. He has served as the ambassador to Cote d'Ivoire in Guinea and diplomatic missions in Gabon, Madagascar, Malawi, Bangladesh, Canada, and Mexico. Ambassador Carter earned a master's in international and development economics from Yale and a bachelor's in economics and history from Drew University. Kate Knopf is the director of the African Center for Strategic Studies, where she has served as director since July 2014. Kate has spent most of her career focused on the intersection of security and development in Africa. From 2001 to 2009, she held several senior positions at the U.S. Agency for International Development, including as Assistant Administrator for Africa, Sudan Mission Director, Deputy Assistant Administrator for Africa, and Special Assistant Senior Policy Advisor to the Administrator. Ms. Knopf has also been a Senior Advisor for the Crisis Management Initiative and a Visiting Policy Fellow at the Center for Global Development. Kate holds a Master's in International Relations with concentrations in African Studies and Conflict Management from Johns Hopkins University, Paul H. Neitz School of Advanced International Studies, and a BA in International Relations from Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. Now that we confirm that I'm the least educated person in front of you today, <laughs> uh, I'd like to begin uh, with opening remarks from, uh, from uh, Ambassador Carter and then Kate, and then uh, we'll, we'll follow up with some additional questions. So Ambassador Carter, sure. Thank you. and. Uh, uh, thanks to the Association of the U.S. Army and PKSOI and the War College and everyone else, and you're all of you for your patience for hanging in till this last panel. I appreciate that. Um, the challenge for us is to look at the future, so we are going to be 100% right, and we can be 100% wrong the day after tomorrow. Um, and I think what I'm going to do is 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 kind of recast the argument. I mean, look at the continent as a whole first of all. I mean, we can talk about bilateral issues, but when we're looking at the security space and the issue of U.S. interests in Africa, it's difficult to, uh, I mean, we could spend, uh, well, I could get a Ph.D. in discussing that if we break it down by each of the 54 countries. I don't want to do that. Um, so let's look at the challenges. Let's look at the security space in Africa uh, for the future and what does that pertain to the United States. 
And in my view is that Africa's security over the next 10 years will not be determined by how the continent grapples with the threat of terrorist networks, which is the current focus of US military activity on the continent. Instead, Africa's security space will be shaped by infrastructure, the creation of it, and how Africa as a continent can marshal the resources for massive investment in infrastructure that, imp that improves its networks, its own positive networks and connectivity. These are roads, rail, ports, power generation distribution, fiber optic cables, et cetera, will determine whether it will be resilient enough to navigate a fast approaching horizon of challenges and risks. No society can achieve sustained economic growth or, or effective growth rates, and I'm talking about continentally, okay? There are some countries that are doing better than others, but continentally, <laughs> without investing in their infrastructure. That has been a, a constant in economic development over, the, over several hundreds of years. And Africa is lacking that. And the development of networks and the connections they create will be a primary factor in determining Africa's prosperity over the next 10 years and beyond. The continent's governments will need to aggressively implement a private sector-led economic growth strategy for a sustained period in order to create jobs for their burgeoning populations. And this will require an urgent and daunting shift in governance and economic policy, as well as a level of continental and regional cooperation that is essentially unprecedented <laughs> for Africa. And frankly, in many respects, when you look at it continentally and look at the scope of the problem for the planet, there are significant challenges facing Africa and why this need for infrastructure is going to be so important. The first one is one that they have little control over, ironically. It's climate change. We've seen this regardless of whether you want to set aside the argument of who's creating it, it's happening. And the challenges that climate change pose for Africa are, are significant. Desertification is one issue. The problem of rising oceans in terms of the coastal uh, communities is going to be even more dramatic. Changes in temperature are changing the flora and fauna of the continent. And um, how one mitigates those impacts is going to require infrastructure. How one's going to deal with that is going to be require investments. Africa is the continent to have, that will have faced the greatest impact of climate change and it is the one area of the world that has the least ability to affect any positive uh, effort. <coughs> the effects of climate change will also displace and push Africans to cities. It's already pushing people now in terms of uh, food insecurity, in, in terms of uh, desertification. And it's going to push people towards cities within the continent and outside of it, and we're already beginning to see that. The other thing is that climate change will also raise the prospect of greater pandemics hitting the continent, and, and because, of, because there are epidemics and pandemics that will spread. We've got a taste of that, and if you look at the, the basic problems of disease in terms of the three major, uh, more recent pandemic issues on the planet, uh, four of them, three came out of Africa. You know, we had the Ebola crisis, we have HIV AIDS, we had Zika, um, who knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Against this backdrop, you have a uh, population dynamic. You have a situation where the planet is going to have a population by 2030 of around 9.3, 9.5 billion people. And um, hopefully the planet's uh, population will stabilize at a natural rate of, of around 10 billion at the end of this century. Um, where those people are located will be a major challenge for Africa. And the developed world, Europe, United States, Japan, will get smaller in terms of population in relationship to the developing world. And to give you a sense of this is that Nigeria will become the third most populous country, surpassing the United States with a population of over 400 million in about 20 years, 30 years. One in four um, Africans is a Nigerian. And by 2050, one in four people on the planet will be African. 25% of the world's population will be on this planet, will be on this planet, will be from Africa in about 30 years, maybe 35. They'll be young. This is the youngest continent on the planet in terms of age. The median age is around 19 and a half, 20 years old. And in about by 2030, 2040, I'm talking more than 10 years that you gave me, but I'm gonna go beyond that. Um, it's gonna be a little bit older. It's gonna be like 22, 23. So it'll be the largest labor pool, and Africa by then will have about 2 billion people. 
and it'll be the largest labor pool on the planet of young people, right? Buttressed up against what? Against Europe, which is aging, gray. And we're already getting, beginning to see some of the impact of the lack of effective infrastructure and opportunity in Africa currently. But this issue of migration is an important issue to take into, con into consideration as what does it mean for Africa in and of itself? I mean, everyone is all focused on this thing about, you know, people crossing the Mediterranean, what, 175,000 over the course of a year. And it's, it's daunting for the European Union, some of the wealthiest countries on the planet, right, all 27 of them, trying to figure out what to do with 175,000 people coming across. The metropolitan zone of Johannesburg and Pretoria and Swanee over the last 10 years has had to cope with 225,000 people moving into their area every year from other African areas, other African countries. And that kind of internal migration within Africa is going on now. Millions are moving, being displaced as a result of violence, as a result of economic deprivation, as a result of climate change. This is happening now. It's going to get even more accelerated. And Africa will become largely urban. Fastest urbanization rates on the planet are in Africa. And, you know, pretty soon Africa will be largely the character of the average African. She will be living in an urban space. And how does one manage that? And what will those urban spaces look like? Well, right now they're mostly slums, which means they lack basic services and all that, and those are mean streets. And how does one create economic opportunity out of that? Well, let's go back to that word again, infrastructure investment. And the bulk of that investment should be African. What we've seen, I'm an economist by training, political economist by training, and what you see is that foreign direct investment is a useful thing, but the most important thing is domestic investment. Society's investing in and of its, in and itself for its future. Now that's a problem right now for Africa because general figures are that the illicit outflows from Africa exceed the official development assistant inflows into the continent. And that, you know, Africa is going to need about over the next 10, 15 years, about $1.5 trillion of investment for the infrastructure needs that it has. And it generally is leaking about a billion, $100 billion every year. So if you look, calculate it, they could basically, they have the money to invest in their own country, in their own countries, in their own infrastructure, but they're putting it in Swiss bank accounts or, you know, real estate in Bel Air or Beverly Hills or Staten. And so we're looking at those challenges, and that's a question of governance. And the other thing is, is that as these young people, there's a lot of young people, are moving into the cities, they're hyper-connected. Um, mobile phones, smartphones. Young people of Africa today are more connected than any of the previous generations. They're talking to each other, and in many respects, an urbanite in Nairobi has more in common with someone in um, a European capital or a Middle East capital than they do in the, in a, with someone from the village in their own country. So that's something to keep in mind, is that the connectivity isn't necessarily the capital to the countryside, but the <coughs> capitals to other capitals. And this is the issue that we need to look at, is the importance of, through globalization, which did not homogenize people, it brought, actually brought greater heterogeneity to communication and to identification, which allowed simple ideas to be, or simplistic ideas, or stupid ideas to be <coughs> transmitted rather quickly. Where you can be a, a guy, you know, in the old days, you know, Hyde Park, Speaker's Corner in, in London, you know, you could say anything you wanted to, so, or if you were uh, an, an individual who had some kind of Looney Tune idea, you could stand on a pulpit somewhere and make your declarations, and in the old days, you might get a small coverage of a couple of lines in a local paper, and that would be it. Well, today, the internet is Hyde's part, it's speaker's corner, right? So you can have a minister of a congregation of about 45 people hanging out in some part of Florida, say he wants to burn the Koran, and all of a sudden you have riots in Khartoum, threatening the American embassy. That connectivity is existing now, and with it come changing expectations. And what we're seeing with the youth of Africa today is that they're demanding more. They're moving into cities and they want services. They want clean water, electricity, educational opportunity, jobs. They're demanding it. So the question of governance is going to be coming up. 
The question is what kind of governance are we going to be looking at in Africa? And I would suggest that just as this movement to cities is happening, that it's at the sub-provincial level. It's at, not at the national level anymore that we need to look at, perhaps. We need to look at cities. We need to look at states, certain governors, and mayors may actually be being the most important political partners we engage rather than heads of state. Mayors have to get things done. They have to, if they don't fix the potholes, if they don't pick up the garbage, if they don't provide potable water, they're out of office. Or there's riots, right? Well, if Africa is going to be increasingly defined by cities <coughs> and young people demanding services, then we need to think about how, that how can we effectively engage in that security space? What can we bring to the arguments for people looking to bring stability and prosperity to Africa? So when you look at that, when you look at those issues, where you have this kind of devolution happening in terms of governance and hopefully democracy too, that these, are, these cities will be democratically managed. That's not an assured thing. And uh, frankly, I think we need to stop talking about democracy in the way we have in the past. I think we've been taken hostage by ha having elections. Elections are not, they're not democracy. Democracy is a culture. I think we need to get back to the basic definitions of good governance so that societies, administrations, governments are responsive to the needs of the population. Respo and those needs are security. What is that security? Is it state security or is it citizen security? The basic themes that we've had in the past is that we will work with institutions and if those institutions get stronger, the state institution gets stronger, shabam, there's security in the country. Eh, that assumes that that institution cares about what the people think. That, that assumes that that state institution, that military, that police force, that president cares what his people think. So that has to be tested. There's going to be greater demands for urban security. So the investments that we make need to be reconsidered. AFRICOM is a unique institution insofar as that it brings a lot of focus to the question of security in Africa. And my recommendation would be that over the next 10 years that the argument from AFRICOM come forward, that while it's not in your, in your wheelhouse, in many respects, Leadership in Africa should start raising the policy discussions that we need to do more about urban security, community policing, working with shoring up police forces in Africa than we ever have before. And the only institution that seems to be able to have, can raise that question, even though you don't have the legal mandate to, to, to effect those operations, is Africa. If Africa is to be that shining spot in the U.S. government that focuses on African security, it has to look at the question of civilian security as well. It has to engage other partners, the INL, the FBI, the Homeland Security, the U.S. government, the Congress, to free up the resources so that we can do more to provide security in urban centers in Africa. We also need to look at that question of investment. How can we how can we leverage certain things? How can we leverage the, the, the resources that Africa has? Right now, if you're a country that has oil in Africa, you're not doing very well. What we've seen during the last commodity crisis is those countries that were diversified, that focused on human on their, on, their, on their populations, did better than those that were oil rich. In fact, if you have a lot of oil, that's actually a license for you to become impoverished. Okay? And what does that mean? The second thing is, is that when you're looking at this question of, of uh, capital requirements and resources, Africa has them. I mean, it's a question of leveraging effectively what the Africans already possess. How do we engage in that conversation? How do we look at the issue of the broader security space for Africa? Is it necessarily talking about militaries? I think, you know, when I was in Africa, we started the discussion about defense institution building, and we went into contortions about what the hell that meant. Well, it's basic. I mean, it's it's... <laughs> You have to have the institutions that can support the security apparatus of a country, and it has to be done in an accountable, transparent way. It's about, it's sex, it's about these really cutting-edge, sexy security stuff, like budgets and recruitment and training and retirement and stuff like that. It's about helping governments have their own, develop their own capacity for an interagency, interministerial conversations. We saw this with the Ebola crisis where we essentially had to, had to force African governments to talk amongst themselves about how to deal with some of these issues. 
This is what you heard about the Boko Haram issue, where we're compelling governments to talk to each other to deal with a regional threat. And even that, what you heard at the end, was incredibly fragile. And the sustainability of it is questionable, because we know there's not really a clear sense of political will or buy-in by those African partners for the fight against Boko Haram. The problem of Mali and the French intervention that was so successful in, th in thwarting Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, that did not occur in a vacuum. That was a, that was a direct result of very poor governance on the part of the government of Bamako. And how is that going to be resolved? And the final question we all have to look at ourselves when we look at the question of security is, what is the metric for success? How do we work ourselves out of the problem set that we face? How do we define that? I mean, terrorism has been around as long as humanity has been around. So what is the threshold that we gauge? Is it the question of being able to help these countries develop the resilience and the capacity to manage the security challenges on their own? That's the line we give. What does that really mean? Where are those investments to be made? And my concern is that if we continue to focus on the sharp end of the stick with regard to going after terrorist threats, which don't really threaten the United States as directly as we think they do, we actually may be making things worse by creating a distortion in the kind of security investments that, hap that are happening in Africa now that leads us into a situation of whack-a-mole, that leads us into a situation where militaries become the dominant, military dominant security forces in Africa, which, whose relationship to, their, to who they have to govern, to who they have to protect, are disassociated. It's a question we have to look at. There is a sense of urgency here, by the way. I mean, crisis falls on top of crisis, which falls on top of crisis. And in Africa, the demographics are relentless. It's not going to stop. And the more we debate, the, the more people are born, and the, the, the bigger the cities become, and we debate. I think we need to have within the construct of our own internal deliberations, and this is where AFRICOM can take a real lead because it is focused on these issues, unlike any other institution that I've seen in, in the U.S. government, is to talk about the risks necessary for the policies we must put in place. I think there has to be a higher tolerance of risk. We need to try stuff. If we fail, we learn from it. But if we have to go in and ensure that everything we're going to do is a resounding success, we will be frozen. Africa is happening. Networks are developing. The question is, are we able to put in place and help the Africans put in place the good networks so that the bad ones don't override the future for the continent? This horizon is approaching us very fast, and we have to look at it. And the other thing is, is that it's not a high-tech solution here. There's a lot of effort to focus on technology and stuff. What we're talking about are basic administrative systems, basic communications, basic information, talking to folks back and forth so that communities understand what's going on. And that's really the challenge that we have to face. You're going, to see, you're going to see this, it's happening now. And AFRICOM is in a unique position to look at this question, to raise the issue of police training in a more aggressive fashion within the construct of the U.S. interagency, to focus, to shift the argument from de -emphasize to de-emphasize the issue of state security versus citizen security or civilian security, to look at the issue of urbanization as both a driver for violence but a driver for prosperity. All of the factors that are necessary to drive greater prosperity into an economic society are the same drivers that lead to conflict. So you're going to have both. So how do you deal with the conflict in a way that doesn't derail economic growth? This is the primary security question facing us, facing the continent, and how do we, how do we engage in that? It's a totally different problem set. But now's the time to have that discussion and to have it effectively. And frankly, this is where I think AFRICOM can show real leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Kate Knopf, please. Um, thank you uh, very much uh, to our organizers uh, and uh, to uh, bringing us together to reflect uh, on uh, the past decade of experience. You know, I had the privilege to be at USAID as assistant administrator when AFRICOM was stood up. Uh, so uh, it's been an interesting time to, to sit and, and think back across uh, these 10 years. And from my more recent vantage point at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, which is a little part of DOD, uh, we're an academic center based at the National Defense University, but our focus is really on our African security sector colleagues uh, principally, uh, and then supporting our own uh, DOD and interagency colleagues 
uh, secondarily. Uh, and uh, we uh, have the privilege to, to really uh, dig into African security trends and analysis. That's one of our mandates from Congress uh, in our current capacity uh, at ACSS. Um, and I, I have to uh, say that I agree with much of what uh, Phil uh, has just uh, said, uh, which uh, won't be terribly surprising, but I'll be slightly you know, provocative and uh, uh, add a twist uh, to his comments you know, looking forward uh, at Africa and at African security trends, and um, even wonder out loud if we really need AFRICOM, uh, in fact, uh, to meet uh, those challenges. Uh, and let me explain uh, what I mean by that. Uh, Africa doesn't really need armies. It needs police forces and gendarmerie and border security uh, and other uh, uh, forms of citizen security for all the reasons that uh, Ambassador Carter just laid out. Uh, AFRICOM uh, is currently not set up uh, uh, to really focus on that. Uh, there are elements of it. Uh, it is an interesting uh, command uh, in terms of the interagency nature of it, and that deserves to be unpacked and uh, uh, appreciated, and I trust that this day has, has helped to do that. Uh, but when we think about uh, the devolution and the nature of the challenges going forward, uh, building national armies and militaries uh, is not uh, the principal response uh, that uh, the challenge requires. Yeah, I think in order to think about the next 10 years, we really do have to go beyond, uh, as Phil did, uh, and look at these mega trends uh, confronting the continent. It is absolutely uh, the case that Africa is nowhere set to keep pace economically with its demographic growth. And that is a frightening prospect. Uh, while there's a lot of uh, amazing things happening on the continent, while it's uh, a very large and diverse place of 54 countries and 1.2 billion people, uh, by and large, economic growth, uh, jobs will not be there uh, for uh, all, all of the people uh, uh, that are yet to become. And one in four of them uh, will be uh, uh, African, as, as Phil says. So I, I, I sometimes find the question of does Africa matter or what are U.S. interests uh, perplexing you know, because you know, it matters what's happening with a quarter of the, the world's population. And we can't just care about it in 2050. We need to start thinking about that and you know, focusing on that now. AFRICOM, you know, from my observation, uh, is principally focused and, and appropriately so on potential threats to the United States from Africa. Uh, and. Yeah, that's why when we look at the map of the continent and we hear about uh, the lines of effort, uh, they are focused on uh, areas of intersection where we can see potential challenges that uh, directly affect uh, are there our homeland security uh, or our citizens uh, on the continent. Yeah, and that's different, uh, I think, than USAID's uh, focus uh, uh, across Africa uh, if it's truly uh, allowed to, to look at it uh, from a development perspective. Uh, all the reasons that Chris uh, gave uh, uh, still hold uh, held true 10 years ago, still hold true now, I think will continue to be a challenge in terms of having a true development uh, strategy for the continent. And then looking politically at what's happening on the continent as well in terms of state society relationships. Uh, that's uh, also a broader set uh, of concerns and challenges that requires the State Department to focus on countries that really don't register uh, on uh, AFRICOM's list of priorities in any way. Uh, and that's a disconnect that uh, requires uh, being candid about. Uh, it doesn't mean that one is right and one is wrong. It means that there are different institutional equities and uh, uh, mandates uh, for different agencies of our government. Everyone shouldn't be doing the same thing all the time, but we do have to figure out how to manage those hydraulics uh, uh, across these different uh, sets of priorities, different resources, uh, different tools that we have uh, to address the challenges uh, that we do see. I have the privilege uh, in my current role to, to moderate uh, what is called the Africa Strategic Dialogue uh, that was mentioned uh, a couple of times uh, uh, earlier today. Uh, General Rodriguez initiated that. Uh, uh, the command uh, really reached out uh, to uh, State Department and USAID uh, to have a conversation. What it's become over the last couple of years is a conversation once a year uh, at the Assistant Secretary, Assistant Administrator, uh, Combatant Commander level of State, USAID, and DOD uh, focused on Africa. Uh, and it is a really valuable uh, space uh, for a candid conversation to step back uh, and think about these hydraulics of the three Ds and what the United States is you know, trying to do on the continent, uh, what's working, uh, what's not working. Uh, 
I see a lot of progress in that discussion uh, across the interagency since when I sat in one of those policy seats. Um, but I also see a lot of work still to be done. Uh, and I think part of that is this uh, difference of, uh, uh, of, um, of the size of our bureaucracies, of uh, the responsibilities uh, of our agencies, uh, and of our understanding of the continent uh, and the challenges uh, ahead of it. Um, one of the things that comes up quite regularly in these discussions is the need for a shared analysis, a, a shared understanding of the context. And I can hear that came out of uh, some of the panels uh, earlier today as well. Yeah, that's something we should be able to tackle and surmount, and we haven't yet. Yeah, and so maybe, uh, to be slightly less uh, provocative and controversial, that would be uh, one of the benefits that AFRICOM, uh, going forward, uh, can really use uh, its um, platform uh, to, to bring to the table uh, in a more enduring way for the, for the interagency uh, focused on Africa. Not to dominate it from a DOD perspective, yeah, because that's, again, I, I think uh, justifiably a more narrow focus on the continent, yeah, but uh, to give space uh, for uh, uh, an analysis uh, and uh, a, a true political economy uh, understanding uh, of uh, not just national level dynamics on the continent, but the sub-regional, the sub-national, the transnational uh, that are really uh, uh, posing challenges. Yeah. Just to, to complement a, a few of the points uh, from Phil further, you know, in terms of migration and security uh, on the continent, uh, right now 20 million people uh, in Africa are displaced or refugees or asylum seekers. Uh, two thirds of those uh, people are internally displaced within their own countries. Uh, and only 1% of that figure uh, is outflow to Europe, 1%. So when we're talking about uh, uh, what our security uh, interests and concerns or our partner security interests and concerns are, the vast majority of that uh, stress is being handled or not uh, by African states and African societies, uh, not by the United States or our European uh, allies. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a pretty stunning uh, reality. Uh, if I can put it even further, uh, a part of the continent I focus a lot on uh, is South Sudan. A uh, little country that uh, uh, is utterly a false state, uh, if any place ever uh, uh, was or is. Uh, but one million South Sudanese have crossed the border into northern Uganda just in the last year. One million. That's the total migration uh, flow into Europe. Uh, not just from Africa, but from uh, Afghanistan, Syria, other countries too. Uh, and that's just into northern Uganda, not all of Europe. So these pressures and these stresses uh, are phenomenal. Uh, you juxtapose that with uh, the fact that our security assistance on the continent uh, uh, goes uh, to the partners uh, uh, by, with, and through uh, that uh, we've assessed and determined uh, uh, are responsive and uh, uh, needed uh, for those threats that we can see coming back and touching the United States. But our largest security assistance partners in sub-Saharan Africa are also some of the least democratic countries on the continent and uh, not trending in a positive direction coming out of authoritarianism. And that's a problem for the people of those countries, uh, fundamentally, in terms of addressing all of the, the challenges that uh, they have uh, coming at them uh, and uh, being compounded uh, as uh, population continues to grow and economic growth you know, as impressive as it is in some countries you know, on the continent, does not keep pace. And so I think we have some really um, still difficult uh, uh, questions uh, to handle and uh, uh, to um, try and uh, get to better answers across the interagency in terms of what is a, a theory of change across our sectors, uh, broadly speaking, uh, our defense, our security interests, our development interests, uh, uh, and priorities and our diplomatic or political priorities. How, how do these three Ds uh, come together so that we have strategic success, uh, as I think uh, somebody on the last panel uh, said it? Uh, how do we do it so that we even have uh, not one success in one lane negating success in another lane? Uh, because uh, they're not all mutually reinforcing uh, sectors and objectives. Uh, despite our best efforts uh, uh, to earnestly deploy our programs, our resources, uh, the tools that we have uh, to achieve uh, the best outcomes within our respective responsibilities. Um, I think these are not just questions for AFRICOM. I think these are collective questions uh, for the U.S. government uh, uh, and for other external actors uh, on the continent uh, as they seek uh, to try and 
uh, help the continent uh, and uh, countries, societies uh, deal with that uh, within. Um, uh, I think fundamental to that uh, is uh, also uh, recognition of uh, the nature of the state uh, on the continent. Uh, and it's a question of democracy for sure. Uh, it's a question of uh, representative, accountable uh, governance, uh, to, to be clear. Uh, it's not just a Western version of electoral democracy that matters. Uh, and in fact, we can see uh, a growing number of consolidated electoral uh, authoritarian uh, uh, states on the continent. That's not what we're looking for. Yeah, that's not what the, those citizens are looking for uh, in terms of, of their system of government. Um, democracy remains wildly popular on the continent. We know that from uh, opinion polling uh, across uh, Africa. Uh, and yet only 11% of Africans live in full or even flawed democracies. Uh, and so that gap is wide uh, and not narrowing. Uh, and again, incumbent upon us to then ask uh, whether the sum of our efforts uh, is really addressing that uh, or uh, uh, we're uh, bypassing that uh, uh, consideration in, in uh, search of our you know, shorter term, uh, less than 10 year uh, uh, objectives that we have, <laughs> which um, uh, to be clear uh, uh, are also very real uh, and uh, present issues in the pockets of the continent where, where those exist. Um, I think might stop there. I, I had some other comments uh, on uh, theories of change, not just across the three Ds, but on security cooperation more specifically and the kinds of things that AFRICOM uh, does uh, and that we do from a Department of Defense uh, perspective. Um, how terrorism ends, uh, 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 what we mean by building partner capacity or security force assistance, <laughs> defense institution building, yeah, there, I think um, yeah, we've come some distance in, in our uh, work in that area, and I think there are some uh, important uh, uh, challenges left in front of us as we really try to refine what it is we're doing on a continent in a way that uh, supports uh, citizens and societies, uh, not necessarily uh, elites uh, who may or may not be responsive uh, to their people. Thank you. And we'll open up for questions. Sir. Uh, so just to play off the both of you, so Ambassador, you know, what you are laying out for us is, you know, a trajectory, a growing trend, um, the urbanization of Africa and the corresponding need to be for there to be a focus on building security capacity, but in the civilian institutions the police and and then on the other side we say well that may mean that AFRICOM is not a viable headquarters to sort of lead that effort why not because this goes back to we are we have a backbone of a headquarters it has capacity but we are unwilling to give it certain authorities that would allow us to do that and in this region of the world, police are not, they're different than police in the United States, which has a separation between you know, armies and, and police. In many cases, they are national institutions, not just local. So if I could just get the two of you to respond on that. Brian, that's a good question. I think a couple of things. One is, um, this is why I think AFRICOM needs to pose a question to the interagency because I think the exact point you're talking about, the authorities that need to be looked at, and not necessarily the authorities being powered to AFRICOM, but necessarily that, but AFRICOM with its interagency representation can be used to leverage other assets within the U.S. government or can be part of a leveraging process to deal with civilian security in a more robust way that needs to happen. Now, you're right, African police are not like we see in other parts of United States or anything like that, and that these these um, militaries are national institutions, but don't, so are the police. Most of these police are not <laughs> municipal police, they're national police forces. And in fact, there, there, are, more, uh, there are more of them <laughs> than the militaries. Uh, the fact is, is though, they have no investment. And many militaries are there just for regime protection. They're not there to meet uh, this, uh, quote unquote, the sovereign integrity of a state, they're there to protect the government from its people. 
Um, so that is a question that needs to be examined, and you have to ask, you know, what's that going to happen when there's more people in the cities? You're getting a flavor of that in Lome this week. Okay, so that's you're going to see more of those kind of things happening, where people are demanding something. And I think I have to underscore the point that that, that Kate's making is that democracy still has resonance in Africa amongst civilian populations. It matters to people. What it means to them in terms of how it's implemented is an open question that has to be evolved, but they want to have that dialogue. Uh, presidents constantly changing their constitutions so they could have another term is not very popular, actually, in Africa, even though the presidents think that they are loved and that they allow the systems to keep them on. And so I think that's something that has to be examined. But I think that when, you, when I've looked at the interagency process and looking at a sustained discussion about civilian security and who's, who, who's looking at the security space of Africa as a continent, not bilaterally, because that state has that bilateral structure, but regionally and continentally, this really comes down to Africa, to at least start having the discussion or convening the authority, having that convening ability to bring people together to talk about it. And that's what I think is important. So I'll continue to be the cantankerous civilian. Uh, I think policing is a civilian function. Yeah, I, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not a, um, uh, at least in our um, uh, maybe too Western uh, norms, but uh, uh, there, I think we have good reasons why we have separation of uh, military responsibilities and civilian responsibilities. And uh, military objectives uh, are uh, largely different uh, than uh, civilian public safety and security objectives, not that one can't borrow and support and complement the other. <coughs> In fact, uh, we're preparing uh, a workshop for the Nigerian interagency uh, uh, to think about handoff from uh, uh, army to police and other civilian security uh, services in their uh, construct, federal and state level, particularly starting with the Northeast, but uh, looking at other challenges uh, 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 in that country as well. Yeah, and it is up for each country to decide, you know, what is their policing structure. But uh, much like militaries have come from a long history of uh, regime security uh, based on uh, post-colonial uh, legacies, so have police forces. Uh, and uh, our goal, I think, is uh, to encourage uh, states and societies to have a real conversation about what are the security needs uh, of their citizens. Uh, what are the principal uh, threats and challenges to them? Uh, what do citizens want uh, from their security services? What trust are they willing to have? And in whom do they want that? Uh, we come in as a military, uh, as a Department of Defense, uh, and that may or may not line up or even uh, lead to that conversation being happening you know, because we jump, I think, to uh, some conclusions and to starting with the institutions that are there for, for reasonable reasons, uh, to be clear. but. Yeah, I think fundamentally, you know, Africa, you know, in many respects, needs to, to grapple with this across a range of, of uh, uh, services that citizens uh, should uh, expect or could want to expect from their governments. You know, and for us to, to give space for that and to figure out how to be the supporting external actor in that, you know, I, I don't think is uh, our second nature, you know, broadly speaking. Uh, and I think does require some pretty specific contextual you know, knowledge and long-term uh, uh, presence uh, with our African partners that you know, I'm not sure, again, that the AFRICOM specific uh, uh, bureaucracy supports uh, if we're being candid in terms of just rotating through the command at the headquarters level or presence uh, uh, across the continent. So, so I, I, I think there's, there's fair points uh, uh, probably in a number of directions, but uh, uh, we, we really, uh, I think, need to be challenged to think about where does civilian security emanate from, what is required for uh, maintaining day-to-day uh, -day, uh, basic safety and security so that people can go about their business, whatever their livelihood is, uh, they can do that without uh, fear of uh, being uh, attacked, killed, harassed, uh, uh, and increasingly we also have to, to realize that you know, the state uh, is responsible for violence uh, on the continent. Terrorism violence is by far, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, it's not significant in terms of daily threats uh, to civilians uh, in Africa, but uh, state violence and violence against civilians uh, by uh, other kinds of non-state actors is growing significantly. So that challenges us in terms of who we're engaging and who we're capacitating and supporting. To build on that, if we look at our primary mission right now with regard to the CT effort, 
how can we be truly effective in counter, countering violent extremism or counterterrorism operations without helping develop an effective local police force? It's knowing what's going on in the local communities. The number one tool against terrorism is intelligence, it's information, and trying to figure that out. And frankly, militaries trying to get that, that kind of uh, situational awareness of their, of their communities, they don't have that. And it's, it's my view that, you know, this idea that we're going to use high-tech equipment to, to take guys with flip-flops and AK-47s off the battlefield is really not a winning proposition, okay? So trying to get that, that on-the-ground intelligence, trying to get that on-the-ground awareness to deal with the question of terrorism at a local level isn't really a task of the military. It's a task of, 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 of services, intelligence services, but also local police to know what's happening in their communities. And it behooves us, if we want to move forward aggressively on counterterrorism in Africa, that we need to start looking at, these, at the civilian side of the equation in a way that we haven't done in the past. And it also tends to, when we look at the question of peacekeeping, peacekeeping of the future where Africans are playing a major role, right? Peacekeeping of the future uh, of today is not what it was 20 years ago, and tomorrow it's going to be qualitatively different. And these skill sets, the requirements for uh, form police units is increasing. The character of peacekeeping in an urban setting is increasing. The, the effort of trying to do peacekeeping in a counter uh, a terrorism, counter uh, uh, urban, uh, counter uh, urban threats is increasing. Can you imagine what it'd be like to have to conduct a peacekeeping operation in Dadaab or uh, or Kibera or someplace like that? Uh, how who, how would you manage that? And how would we train forces for that? Something to consider. Any other questions? I, uh, I'm going to go off script for a second. I'll come back to you, Ryan. So uh, not much discussion today in the United Nations, and the United Nations General Assembly meeting is occurring the next two weeks, and uh, I forget when uh, the president is speaking tonight, but we tomorrow. I think we should expect a different speech than we had last year, in the last several years. Um, just a guess. Um, but uh, for, for, for the ambassador and for Kate, we'll start with Kate. Um, you know, where do you see the relationship the United States government and, you know, state aid and uh, AFRICOM uh, with respect to the United Nations? You know, nine of the 16 peacekeeping missions are on the continent, and very few have ever ended. Uh, so, you know, what do we see that uh, playing out over the next year? Increasing, decreasing. Obviously, China's role in the continent is increasing a lot, and they're also the participa participation, um, but it doesn't seem like we have achieved any of the end states or political objectives identified. So just, just if we can talk a little bit about the United Nations role. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, I, I think that uh, what's interesting about Africa uh, is that we have um, international and regional mechanisms uh, focused on resolving, uh, trying to resolve conflicts, uh, and uh, increasingly also focused on trying to prevent uh, conflicts. Um, the uh, theme of the current Secretary General is uh, preventing violence. Uh, I think they're launching a big report uh, sometime this week, in fact, uh, which is the next um, iteration of the World Development Report to the World Bank uh, launched in 2011 on conflict security and development. Uh, this next report comes out from UNDP and the World Bank uh, and is meant to, to uh, take a further look at uh, preventing violence. Uh, and what we can know from the experience of the world uh, and uh, 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 successes in uh, ending uh, violence and preventing recurrences of violent conflict uh, and what still needs to be understood. Uh, I haven't seen the report, so we'll see how far that goes. Uh, but I think the fact that the Secretary General prioritizes that as, as his theme uh, is uh, deeply important uh, for Africa. Um, I think that our uh, administration uh, will find out. I haven't seen the president's speech, though, so I can't uh, uh, predict uh, uh, where that might go in terms of uh, relating to the United Nations. But you know, it is interesting that our Ambassador Haley, our, our representative there, you know, has been very pragmatic in you know, you know, trying to look at efficiencies and effectiveness of you know, United Nations instruments. Uh, and peacekeeping has uh, been uh, a principal focus of hers, of course. Uh, that uh, largely takes place on the continent of Africa and with African troops uh, in both UN and African Union missions. 
uh, and that will continue to be important. I think we have to go beyond peacekeeping, though, and really ask ourselves the more fundamental questions of are we resolving the conflicts? Yeah, because if we're just you know, stabilizing you know, situations, and that might even be debatable you know, in a number of these cases, you know, for years that turn into decades, you know, but we never bring the political strategy and the political process to match you know, the, the peacekeeping and the peace operations you know, side of it, you know, then we aren't uh, uh, necessarily making matters better. You know, we might be keeping you know, people alive for some time, you know, but we're just changing the, the war you know, political economy you know, of that conflict situation, of, of that violent situation. And, and you know, in a number of these cases, we can make the argument that, uh, in fact, we may be prolonging you know, uh, the conflict in different ways, you know, not just through peacekeeping, but you know, through, through the range of things that we do that are um, palliative in some way, but uh, um, uh, or they're, they're treating symptoms but not ever getting at the root causes of conflict. Yeah, and so I think that's the challenge uh, for us uh, on the continent of Africa, whether we're looking you know, from the United Nations lens uh, and uh, the tools that are available there, not just peace operations, but also conflict management and conflict resolution from a political sense. Now, with respect to Africa, it gets complicated in some way because of the African Union and uh, the uh, sub-regional organizations, uh, both the standing uh, traditional RECs and the, the newer ad hoc arrangements. Uh, and the principle of subsidiarity that's very important uh, to our African colleagues in their peace and security architecture. Uh, and that basically means that the UN Security Council defers to the African Union, which then defers to the sub-regional organization uh, if there's one that's um, uh, uh, somehow holding the file uh, for uh, a crisis or, or a conflict situation. Uh, and we've seen some success uh, with that, uh, uh, most uh, dramatically uh, on the West African side of the continent. Uh, and we've seen um, some, some really tragic uh, misses in terms of addressing uh, uh, violence and conflict, uh, particularly on the Eastern side of the, conflict at the uh, continent at the moment. Um, so, th so that's a challenge, I think, across the United Nations, the AU, and the regional organizations on the continent. Uh, to really figure out the division of labor and to come up with a better uh, partnership arrangement that is pragmatic uh, in terms of recognizing when uh, it's just not going to be reasonable for the sub-regional organization uh, to take the lead because the interests of the neighbors uh, are too uh, conflicting you know, with each other to ever uh, get to, to a positive strategy forward. I'd argue that's the case with South Sudan at the moment. Yeah, and uh, in other moments, uh, absolutely the sub-regional organization is going to be the best uh, to, to be out in front. And then it's for the United Nations, the African Union, to figure out how to support that uh, and take it. Thanks, Kate. Ambassador? Peacekeeping operations. The average peacekeeping operation lasts around 14 to 17 years. And then the conflict starts again once they leave. Um, sometimes you got to give war a chance. The the issue here is that the drivers of conflict are rarely addressed through a diplomatic effort to staunch the bloodshed. I mean, we have a humanitarian response. We need to go in. We need to stop the fighting. We need to, we need to stop the killing of innocents. I get that. I did that. Yeah. But in the end, the, and I think Kate said it right, we change the political economy of the conflict. You don't end the conflict. You just change it. You morph it. And you subsidize it through the peacekeeping operations. So there needs to be a different set of metrics that looks at how peacekeeping is to be conducted and what are the metrics to pull out. There should be a constant evaluation of why we're still there rather than why we need to continue to be in this place. And what you find is that governments become rather dependent upon having a UN peacekeeping operation there. It's either a good uh, sense of security for the regime or it's something that they can use to leverage against their opponents to say, well, you know, we need, the UN is the problem. There, there, you know, or we need to, or use the UN to to keep an area quiet or whatever. And so you have to look at is it really what is being achieved here? And this idea that well, we more people would have died without the with the pe without the peacekeeping than if it was there. Yeah, but then if you start having this thing going on for decades, you begin to ask yourself what's the utility of this? What really is being solved by this operation? The other thing is, is that I think we need to, and I have to stress the point, is that you know we talk about these institutions, ECOWAS, we talk about SADC, we talk about the African Union. These are really kind of hollow organizations, okay? I mean, the African Union only now is coming up with a formula by which it can pay for itself. 
I mean, until, you know, basically, uh, until a few years ago, only basically four countries only paid for the African Union's membership dues, only four countries out of the 54, and one of them was Gaddafi's Libya, and they're not paying anymore, all right? So they got an issue, and now they're trying to levy a tax and try to get some resources to, to operate their, their facilities and stuff like that, keep the air conditioning going on in their new building that the Chinese built for them. It's great. But can they really do what they say they want to do? They're a very aspirational organizations. And so, you know, and they have a lot of, a lot of challenges within their own kind of political di dilemma. Look at the Africa stand up, standby force. I mean, really? Seriously? Okay. Some places it works, some places it doesn't, some places it doesn't exist. Um, so you look at the regional organizations, and to me, that is where we need to focus our interests. We need to see what we can do more to shore up things like SADC and, and, uh, and the East Africa, um, uh, I want to say Visa, EC, yeah, and ECOWAS, and see what we can get there. I mean, the Central Africa thing, never. It's not going to happen right now. But, you know, what can we do to work with those organizations? And ECOWAS worked when Nigeria was strong. When Nigeria gets weak, ECOWAS doesn't work. It's a bit wobbly, all right? ECOWAS, and here is the dichotomy as to how it administers itself. Look at what's happening in Togo compared to what happened in the Gambia. And you see the two different things. The fact that the president of Togo is the head of ECOWAS right now is an awkward moment, right? But in the Gambia, ECOWAS played a good, a strong role. They played a strong role in other areas, but I've also seen them stumble because they were aspirational. They just, they believed that they had stuff that they didn't have, that they could do things that they couldn't do. And it, it was just kind of, it was, it was a very, it's a very surreal in place to be when you hear these people talking about what they're going to do and you have to raise your hand as the outsider says, uh, you don't have the resources for that. You don't have the troops for that. You don't have the airlift for that. How are you going to do that? Um, so I think that's one thing. The second thing is, is that uh, on peacekeeping, you know, unless we want to, I mean, we need to play a greater role in it to make it better. If we're constantly going to be kind of in the corner saying, hey, we'll give you a check, but we're being critical in the peanut gallery throwing stuff down at them, no. I mean, we, I think we need to start seeing more American participation in peacekeeping operations. The Chinese are seeing that as a worthwhile investment. We should see it as well. You know, I think, it's a, I think it's time has passed for the United States not to be participating in peacekeeping operations in Africa. Troops on the ground. It helps our services in terms of getting that situational awareness, what's going on, makes us better at it. Africans have a lot of experience in it. We could learn from them, believe it or not. And I think we should take that role on. Thank you. There Go ahead, Ryan. Sure. Uh, again, Ryan McCannell. I'm glad we have 14 to 17 more years at PKSOI we can count on. And we appreciate it whenever you ask a question about peacekeeping, which was actually my, my question had to do with the RECs, but I wanted to, uh, since it was pretty much answered, wanted to ask you what is the message of the United States to this new generation of Africans? And I, I think it, it's salient given the difficulties that AFRICOM originally had in explaining its purpose to the continent. So for a new generation of Africans, understanding that there are other international players out there and that there are always questions about why the United States cares about Africa, what's the message back to those young, Af this new generation of young Africans? Well, first of all, uh, the young generation of Africans, for the most part, really are interested in what Americans think <coughs> and what we offer. Um, you know, one of the most successful programs we have is this Young African Leaders Initiative. Uh, the question isn't should we continue it, the question is how do we make it stronger, how do we make it more profound, how do we provide greater educational opportunities for Africans in the United States so they can see what and bring those skills back. Um, you know, they're looking at opportunity, so the entrepreneurial spirit of the young Africans is something that, we need to be, that needs to be tapped. We have to figure out ways to do that. The fact that they have other choices is interesting because in the, in, yes, there is China's out there and stuff, but that is not the first order of interest on the part of the African youth with regard to looking at educational opportunities, looking at commercial opportunities, looking at the issues that pertain to them. They look to what we put forward. And so it's the values that the United States put forward, puts forward that kind of resonate on the continent. I've seen it for the last 34 years and it, it continues to be there. So the message we have is that, you know, to, to the young Africans is that, you know, w there is opportunity that one can make for oneself provided the resources are there and you have to demand it from your gov those who govern you. And how we can help facilitate that discussion for the African youth is an important point. And we need to focus on that because the, the coming generation is here now, okay? 
And we need to recognize that, and we need to understand that you know, African youth are coming over the hill in numbers we've never seen before. And they're occupying the cities, and they're going to be the drivers of economic prosperity or conflict. And we need to be able to, to engage them effectively. They want to engage the United States. They like the font of goodwill to the United States amongst Africans is still there. And it's very broad, and it's very deep. And it behooves us to, to foster that and to build upon that. Um, I wanted to just uh, make one comment more on peacekeeping and conflict management and then address Ryan's question on, on youth. Uh, and, and that is to say that I, I think we um, could be challenged uh, to have uh, a more nuanced uh, perspective uh, and assessment of the strength of regional institutions on the continent and um, the role of African peace and security architecture. Uh, uh, on the one hand, there are a lot of failures uh, and uh, a lot of ways that uh, the institutions uh, don't measure up and, and don't achieve the, the aspirations that, that our African colleagues themselves uh, express uh, for them. In other ways, uh, Africa has gone far further than other regions of the world in uh, developing norms and actually operational ways of uh, affecting those norms. Uh, and that includes on democracy uh, as well as on uh, putting, uh, dealing with uh, uh, violent uh, conflict. Uh, and uh, I, I think that uh, deserves recognition and appreciation in terms of uh, how we uh, judge them and uh, when we uh, deem them uh, uh, worthy of support or interested in, in our support. Uh, I, I think the pace uh, varies a lot and leadership uh, does matter, uh, uh, both at uh, uh, the political level uh, as well as uh, the, the career and the secretariat level. Yeah, but there's a lot of strength uh, embedded in some of these uh, institutions in different ways. And um, <clears throat> yeah, as I think uh, the panel in the Lake Chad uh, Basin uh, uh, discussed, uh, both on the military and the civilian side, uh, we can find more transformative power by working uh, with African institutions and, and entities that are really trying to address uh, their challenges in, in different ways. Um, I, I think for African youth, uh, looking at the United States, um, uh, the thing I worry about uh, and uh, what I hear uh, when I have the opportunity to engage uh, uh, with youth from the continent, uh, particularly in, in the realm of uh, security challenges, but, but even more broadly, uh, is um, a lot of judgment uh, in terms of uh, why are we uh, supporting illegitimate leaders uh, in the eyes of youth. Uh, they do want democracy, meaning they want to have a voice. Uh, and uh, in many countries, they don't see an outlet uh, for uh, having that voice and, and that inclusion. Uh, they want economic opportunity uh, and livelihoods. Uh, and uh, this is uh, more and more problematic uh, the more educated uh, youth get uh, and the more connected, uh, as Phil discussed earlier, they are. Uh, and uh, grievances uh, and uh, disparities uh, are more evident. Uh, but uh, the United States uh, is, is still looked to uh, as uh, um, uh, um, a source of inspiration, uh, uh, both in terms of uh, democratic governance and uh, economic opportunity. And while we have our struggles as a nation, uh, like all nations do, uh, how we uh, respond to and uh, interact with leadership in African countries, uh, particularly as uh, we have more and more constitutional challenges and extra constitutional challenges and uh, questions of legitimacy uh, of elites uh, uh, politically and economically. Uh, I, I think that's where um, uh, it, it would behoove us uh, uh, from the U.S. government side to, to really think about what is our role on behalf of the American people uh, to facilitate that relationship with the, the, the rising uh, generation of Africans. Okay. I turn it back over to, to Colonel DeWitt, I think, and then, uh, but a round of applause for our panel, please. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up and uh, close out the event. So throughout the day, we've looked back on AFRICOM, really uh, 10 years young, and Africa. Um, we reviewed the whole of government approach to peacekeeping and stability operations, Lake Chad region, I won't say basin, um, Boko Haram. And then we looked at the uh, future challenges uh, and uh, opportunities, as someone said uh, earlier today. 
Uh, let me highlight just a few uh, remarks uh, mentioned um, and in some cases more than once uh, today. So obviously a whole government approach, uh, we're, we're all um, uh, understand that. Uh, not, not a single entity can, can, can garner success in this region. Trust, relationship, common picture, unity of effort, uh, sort of the buzzwords. Uh, funding must support policy although at many times it's, it's cobbled and sort of ad hoc uh, to support uh, uh, policy is sort of the norm. Uh, Commander AFRICOM can or must uh, balance uh, short and long-term requirements, um, must address uh, VEO underlining factors, uh, rule of law, governance, economic de development. Um, Sort of switching gears just a little bit, uh, um, Dr. Love talked about no, no formal uh, senior executive uh, program uh, for um, uh, educating our folks at that, that level. Um, we heard part of the uh, integrated research uh, uh, program at the U.S. Army War College talked a little about contracting, uh, leveraging existing systems uh, uh, for visibility, synchronization, and uh, promote crosstalk amongst uh, the, the agencies. Uh, we heard about uh, senior executive attributes, balance, uh, alignment, and flexibility. Um, uh, from the policy side, from the Undersecretary of Defense uh, uh, representative uh, recommending stability policy, uh, and then seeking funding that, that uh, also uh, reinforces uh, stability. Uh, stabilization is a political endeavor. From, uh, from the deputy commander there at uh, AFRICOM, uh, he reinforced the strategic themes, uh, military support to diplomacy, by, with, and through, which we've heard a number of times today, um, and then uh, pressure on the network, countering uh, violent extremist organizations. Uh, heard a little bit about Boko Haram, degrade and contain, uh, harmonizing the, the U.S. government, three Ds and maybe reversing it a, a little bit, putting diplomacy up front, development and in defense. Uh, we heard from USAID, uh, foreign aid budget is, is sort of directive and then other prioritize uh, must solicit uh, for discretionary funding. Uh, Long-term requirements, uh, it, it's all about the political will uh, and maybe it's missing, maybe, maybe not. Uh, heard a high percentage of uh, disenfranchised youth uh, felt the, the government would be their tipping point, especially if something negative happened. Um, we heard from the intelligence community, uh, herding the cats, the kittens there, and, and maybe uh, 18 other agencies that are in support. Um, this region probably demands a, a hybrid response, and stabilization is really about patience. Uh, climate change impacts. Um, they're real pandemics, population growth, internal migration, um, also the urban growth. Um, democracy is not about election. Uh, so many times in my career, that, that was it. The election was it. But we got to remind ourselves that that's not it. Uh, got to focus on the uh, governance. Um, it's about self-development for the for the for the for the government, so they can govern. Um, Africa needs uh, police and border patrol, uh, and I can tell you, PKSY is focused on that. Um, um, Africa, right now, it, it appears that they're, they're un unable to sustain their economic growth um, in concert with the population growth. So um, looking, looking to the future and some uh, issues with that. Uh, need shared analysis and understanding within the interagency, especially um, uh, transnational um, uh, level. Must support the uh, citizens and society and not the elites. Um, and then probably the, the last item I have here is um, uh, sort of that division between the, the military and, and police or policing. Uh, so the bottom line is work remains despite 
uh, areas of success. So I, I'd like to close out this symposium by uh, thanking AUSA, in particular uh, General Hamm and his team, and, um, and also the PKSY team uh, led by the, the young man standing over there, uh, Colonel Sullivan. Uh, so many thanks to our guest speakers that came out today, uh, as well as the uh, panel chairs, as well as our, our panelists. Uh, thank you very much for being part of this. And we've got much to think about as we reflect on uh, the tremendous successes of a, a small um, uh, combatant command, uh, but still, like I said, much to do. So again, thank you for coming out. Safe travels. Excuse me, two, two requests before you leave, then you can clap. Um, <laughs> for AUSA, they'd ask, uh, there's a trash barrel outside here, so if you could grab any cups, plates, or bottles and deposit those. And then if you do not have an emotional tie to the name tag that they gave you, you can deposit that in the orange box and they will reuse those with somebody else's name. Okay, thanks very much and safe travel. Much to do. So again, thank you for coming out. Safe travels. Excuse me, two, two requests before you leave. Then you can clap. Um, <laughs> for AUSA, they'd ask, uh, there's a trash barrel outside here, so if you could grab any.